Welcome to the Crop Protection Network Virtual Crop Scout School episode on armchair scouting, doing your homework before going to the field. My name is Adam Sisson. I am a certified crop advisor and I work for Iowa State University Extension and Outreach as part of the Integrated Pest Management Program. Today we're going to be talking about the things that you can mostly do from home to prepare you before you even set foot in the field. And there's kind of two different things here. We're going to be focusing primarily on the first of those, getting uh, current in-season data about what you might be seeing in the field. And the other part of it, which we won't be talking about quite so much, is just increasing your general knowledge base about what healthy plants insects, disorders, and other issues look like so that you can better recognize them when you go to the field going to touch on a lot of things. Some of them will overlap. That includes uh, extension as a resource, social media, podcasts, apps, and online tools, weather data, books made of real paper that you can hold, soil maps, historical imagery, local conversation, current and past field data, and then also uh, credibility and applicability, which are important things to think about. One of the first resources that uh, um, that is available to you is land grant extension. Extension does a lot of work to help farmers and others out. One of the things that extension does is release newsletters. You can see up there, we've got one from Purdue called the Pest and Crop Newsletter. There's another one from Iowa State University called the Integrated Crop Management Blog. And then there's another example from Mississippi State Extension called the Mississippi Crop Situation. And you can subscribe to uh, these, and they will go to your uh, email inbox and keep you informed of some of the things that uh, the experts uh, uh, say you should be looking out for. For example, there is a program that monitors black cutworm, which is a lepidopteran pest of corn through Iowa State University. And I do believe that other universities do the same thing. It monitors when the moths come into the state and then also uses a certain measurement of insect development called degree days, which we'll talk about later, to uh, report on when those particular um, eggs that the moths laid will hatch and have developed into a caterpillar that's big enough to be cutting corn. And so these newsletters might help you to figure out, oh, I should be looking for this particular pest at this particular time. People are seeing this in the field, et cetera, et cetera. Now, University Extension also has oftentimes area agents, and you can see maps here from Indiana, Nebraska, and Iowa that help to determine which of those area agents is applicable to your location. Um, and you can get into specific contact with these area agents to, uh, um, to uh, help you. And one example of that is, is this newsletter that's specific to uh, a, a field agronomist from Iowa State University named Josh Michael. Now he covers seven counties in Iowa and uh, he releases a newsletter that's separate from the ICM blog newsletter that I mentioned earlier from Iowa State University that might be more applicable to his specific area of the state. And so you can get the bigger state picture and possibly drill down with extension as well. And there are lots of other resources as well out there. Another important thing to get real-time information is the use of social media. There's Twitter, Instagram, and uh, you folks watching this can probably name more than I can, but Twitter is a particularly important one for ag-based things. And there are industry certified crop advisors and extension that have Twitter accounts that if you follow them, you can get a good handle on what you might be able to see in a field at any particular time. So we've got a private ag business, uh, a, a, a private ag business account up at the top there. And uh, we've got several other folks from extension on the bottom three uh, showing, hey, we're, you know, the one from Darcy Talinko says we uh, are seeing tar spot in our research plots and, and she's in Indiana. And so that might give the person who has subscribed to her account a clue that, hey, tar spot might be showing up about now in the fields that I go to look at. So I might be particularly on the lookout for that. And you can see the one from Tom Allen down in the bottom corner uh, talking about soybean rust that he found in a specific county in Mississippi. 
So find some good uh, social media sources for uh, ag news and make sure you uh, listen up to uh, what they're saying. They can help clue you in about what's going on. There are also podcasts as a resource um, and radio, of course, and you can listen to these uh, while you're driving to uh, uh, college or you're a job or when you're in a um, tractor. And there are ones that are based uh, uh, that uh, that are based out of extension sources. And there are other ones as well. For example, A Penny for Your Thoughts is put on by uh, two guys who are in uh, ag industry, but they really tailor their podcast so that it's uh, wide uh, ranging and not just about their particular company. You can see some great examples up there. There's War Against Weeds. Uh, there's the uh, one based out of Louisiana. You can see in, in the corner there and the Soybean Pest podcast, uh, which is uh, done by Iowa State Entomology. You can subscribe to these on your smartphone, uh, Apple, Spotify. Uh, again, if you like listening to podcasts and uh, want to get the latest on ag news, uh, uh, subscribe in your uh, favorite uh, uh, where. Speaking of software, there's also apps and online tools out there that can help folks be prepared for what they might be seeing in the field uh, at any particular time. Some examples that I'm going to mention include the Corn IPM Pipe, Tar Spotter, Soybean Gall Midge Alert Network, and Sporecaster. The picture you see right now is the Corn IPM uh, tracking software for Tar Spot. You can see a map of the uh, eastern United States there with various counties that are highlighted in gray. Those are the counties where tar spot has been found over the last several years. And uh, each year it has spread a little bit more. And if you are um, on the edge of those grayish highlighted counties, uh, you might be on the lookout for tar spot because it might be continually spreading and spreading into your area um, uh, this next growing season. And as people find it and, uh, they will actually report it. And, uh, those counties will highlight a different color to show where it's been found in the most current year, but you can keep an eye on this. And, you know, if you're far away from some of those highlighted counties and you know, that tar spot may not be a problem, it might not be something that you need to be looking out for in your field. There's an app called tar spotter, which helps to forecast tar spot in an area. This is another one called the Soybean Gall Midge Alert Network, which uh, works similar to the Corn IPM Pipe Tar Spot webpage. You can see the various counties that Soybean Gall Midge, which is a relatively recent soybean pest, you can see where it's been found each year. And very similar to the Corn IPM Pipe one, if you're on the edge of one of those highlighted counties, uh, and you haven't seen soybean gall midge before, well, maybe this year is the lucky year that you find it or unlucky year that you find it out in the fields. And so you might want to pay particular attention to the edges of the field or spots where this pest shows up if you are in one of those highlighted counties or nearby one. Conversely, if you're uh, far away from one of the highlighted counties, you can uh, uh, put uh, soybean gall midge out of your mind because it's not as likely to be there. Here's another app called Sporecaster, which uh, forecasts white mold of soybean. And these are just a few tools. I'm sure you can figure out um, which ones are applicable to your situation. Some local examples include an ISU pest forecasting map, which you can see here, uh, also a Midwest Pest Alert Network and the UNL Soybean Management Calendar. So this ISU pest forecasting map will allow you to program what kind of pest you uh, or select what kind of pest you are interested in and uh, the start date for when you want degree days to uh, start accumulating. And then you can get predictions of or get how many degree days have elapsed uh, for your particular part of Iowa, in this case, on this map. And, and so you can, going back to the black cutworm example I used earlier, you can see how many degree days have elapsed and you can say, oh, I should be looking out for larvae that are cutting corn in my field because this map is predicting that uh, they should be in my area right now, or they should be active in my area. This is an example of the Midwest Pest Alert Network, which lets you sign up for uh, text message alerts. And here's an example of the University of Nebraska Lincoln Soybean Management Calendar. You can see how you can select different different types of uh, pests there from diseases to insects to weeds. And there's a little red line there that shows the current date. And 
when you log in, you will be able to see at least for uh, Nebraska, like what particular uh, pest uh, is likely to be seen at that particular time of the year. So you can use this to figure out, oh, hey, you know, I might be able to see pest X, uh, but pest Y is not gonna come for another month or so. Again, just to help you understand what you're more likely to see in the field versus what probably is not going to be there. Weather data is important as well, and there are lots of different sources for that. One source is the US Drought Monitor, which shows kind of larger scale drought. And uh, I bet this has been visited quite a bit over the last several years, as we have had pretty dry conditions, at least here in the Midwest. And you know that if, so some diseases uh, develop based upon uh, the amount of moisture, a lot of diseases develop based on the amount of moisture that's present. And uh, insects also develop uh, on uh, uh, based on temperature. And so if you uh, know that you have had uh, uh, a drought weather in your area, you know that those diseases that uh, need moisture aren't going to be as prevalent in that area as diseases that may not need moisture to develop as much or thrive or are more problematic in drought conditions. Um, and an example of a disease that uh, is um, that uh, can be seen when it's a little bit drier there would be charcoal rot of corn and soybean and uh, foliar uh, fungal diseases of those crops wouldn't be as prevalent when it's dry. Uh, on the other side of the screen here, you can see some outlooks for precipitation and temperature. And you can use this to kind of help you understand that, oh, hey, it's been wet. It's supposed to be wet. We know that diseases that require wetness might be an issue or it hasn't been that hot out and it's not going to be that hot out. And so insects that develop according to temperature aren't going to be reaching those later life stages. And so again, this will just help you to get kind of a handle on what you could be looking for when you get out into the fields. There are also uh, more local mesonets, for example, the Colorado mesonet, mesonet or the Iowa environmental mesonet, uh, the Louisiana agroclimatic information system, and that can be used to gather additional weather data. There are ways to access degree days. Degree days are a measurement of temperature that helps to gauge uh, how far along in development uh, a plant like corn is or insects are. Um, again, as we mentioned earlier, insects develop uh, uh, according to how hot or cold it is. If it's generally cooler, the insect is not going to develop or go through its life stages as much as it would be if it's hotter, it'll progress through its life stages quicker. And so in this particular tool from the Illinois Climate Network, uh, you can select your area of Illinois and, or the, I guess the location that's closest to you, be it Monmouth or uh, Peoria or Big Bend or DeKalb, and then you can input your planting date and calculate uh, crop degree days. Here's another tool from Illinois, uh, from the Illinois Climate Network. And this lets you select a specific pest that you are looking for, a uh, station that's located nearest you, and then to calculate the degree days that have uh, uh, passed for uh, those particular pests. And because uh, pests are biological creatures, they're going to develop at different rates. For example, the alfalfa weevil might develop uh, faster or slower than, for instance, the black cutworm or the corn rootworm or earworm. And that's why you can select which pest uh, you want to out of this. So you can uh, see which ones, or so you can uh, understand each individual one. All right, this is a, a, a good one here. It's real paper, real books. So you can also get books uh, from land grant extension or professional societies such as the American Pathological Society, Phytopathological Society. You can see an example of one of these books here. These books will uh, help you to understand what healthy plants look like, uh, help you to understand what the various issues that you're scouting for look like. And it's just good to familiarize yourself with these things before you get to the field. It's much easier to come armed with a um, full brain uh, than it is to uh, try to figure it out why you're out there. And of course, you can always ask for help and refer to books later, but get as much knowledge as you can at the get-go and carry that with you into the field. You can't lose it. 
There are farmer's guides, which are put out by the American Phytopathological Society, and those show diseases for wheat, soybean, and corn, and they help you to identify them. But they also have within them a chart that shows what part of the season you're most likely to see those diseases show up. And so, again, that's more useful information to know. This is a resource for a soil map from the USDA NRCS Web Soil Survey. Um, I access, access this online, and this is a map of DeKalb County. Those little orange squiggly lines are the different soil types within that particular place. And uh, this can help you be more informed about the field or the piece of land that you're going to be scouting. Uh, before you even go out there, it might help to explain while uh, why why you might see differences in a, a crop that is the same variety or same hybrid growing in the same field. It might be because there's a difference in the soil type, and there are also some pests such as nematodes that can be more problematic in certain soil types. Nematodes are generally more problematic in sandy soils. So again, use this as a resource to come armed with more knowledge about the place that you're scouting. It's kind of like uh, flyover or reconnaissance. There are also historical imagery sources online. This is a really neat uh, source right here. Um, these are images from the USGS and USDA uh, from the Iowa State University Geographic Information Systems Sport and Research Facility. That's a handful. And you can see the same piece of land from various time frames, from, from aerial images from the 1930s all the way up to 2001. And this is a piece of land from central Iowa. And what kind of stands out in it to me is the uh, there's a, a railroad track that goes through about the middle of the picture in the 1930s and the 1950s. And it's still very clear even into the 1970s. But Sometime between the 1970s and 1990s, it looks like that railroad track was removed and that area was then turned into farmland. Again, here's a close up of the 1950s versus the 2021 aerial imagery. You clearly see the railroad track cutting through the center of the image. And then the color image, there's no longer any railroad track, but you can still see some of the evidence in the field uh, as to where that railroad track once existed. And that, again, might help to explain uh, some of the differences you will see in an area in a crop field, because there might have been past activity in an area that has caused this year's uh, issues. Another thing that's interesting between this 1950s picture and the 2021 picture is the uh, there are less fields and uh, larger fields in 2021 compared to the 1950s there. It's interesting to see that land use change. Here's another example from uh, the 1970s compared to 2021. In the center of the picture, you see some grass waterways in that central plot of land. And by 2021, the grass waterways no longer exist. Instead, you have um, some of those terraces in their place. And so you can just get a feeling for how land use has changed. What existed in this particular pot spot in the past? Are we seeing a difference here because there's an old fence line that was there that is no longer there? Was there an old driveway in this part of the field? Is that why the crops aren't growing as well? Various things like that. Here's another example from the 1950s compared to 2021. What I think might be a railroad track cutting diagonally through the image in the 1950s is no longer there in 2021. And yet, if you look closely, you can still kind of trace where that railroad track used to run because the uh, field is uh, uh, still impacted by it uh, all those years later. Still kind of trace that greenish line where it used to be. All right, the next thing is local conversation. This is not strictly armchair scouting, but at least you can sit while you're talking. And it's just good to talk to the people around you. That includes neighbors, friends, uh, people stopping over in the machine shed or uh, people you meet at the co-op because they're going to have different information sources than you. And they might have visited fields earlier than you and, and they much might know more that can help inform you when you are going out into your field. So this is just a way to get uh, a feel about what's going on in your local area. 
also good to have notes from a previous season about a particular field. Uh, this includes a history of disease or insect pests, weeds that were problematic, herbicide applications, crop rotation. For example, if one year you have a particularly bad uh, fungal disease of corn in a field, uh, and the next time you grow corn in that field, you might want to look out for that disease. Oftentimes, plant diseases will survive in crop residue that is in the field. And, and so if you had um, a disease that was bad one year, pay special attention to that field the next time that that crop is grown there. See if uh, that disease might still be an issue. Herbicide is another uh, one to consider. You might have injury to uh, a certain kind of plant one year that uh, is due to a residual herbicide in the field left over from a previous growing season. So it's good to understand what happened in that field previously so you can uh, get a better picture of what's currently going on. It's also important to know recent field data that includes plant genetics, production practices, and the crop stage. Certain hybrids might be more susceptible to a particular disease than another. If you know that a particular hybrid is susceptible to, say, for instance, northern corn leaf blight, which is a fungal foliar disease of corn, then you might want to pay particular attention when you go to that field and look out for that disease since you know that the, that the genetics of that hybrid predispose to uh, getting uh, northern corn leaf blight when the conditions are right. Not production practices, maybe there were cover crops in the field, and it would be good to know that because there might be issues that could arise or be explained by the presence of cover crops earlier in the growing season. It's also good to know the crop stage. Certain uh, issues um, are more problematic when the crop reaches certain growing stages than at others. And the last thing I want to touch on is credibility and applicability of information. You really want to think about the source of the info that you are getting. What is the motive of the information provider? Are they selling something that, that fixes the issue that they're reporting on? Um, and that's not necessarily a bad thing, but it's just good to think about who is giving you this information. Um, what do they have to gain for it? What do you get out of it? You also want to adjust search terms to select sources, local applicability, and timeliness. For example, if you were just to go to an internet search engine and type in soybean disease, you might get all sorts of things from different areas, um, from out of state, from previous years. Um, but if you refine that a little bit and added, for instance, Iowa State in 2023 to soybean diseases in your search, then you would get information on soybean diseases that is more likely to relate to the state that you're in, Iowa in this instance, and the uh, season that you're interested in, 2023 or whenever that is. So again, think about the source, think about the motive of the provider, and think about how to increase applicability of, of uh, searches when looking for information. With that, I wanted to say thank you. Um, again, uh, I work for the Iowa State University Integrated Pest Management Program, and you can follow that program on Twitter using or with the handle ISU underscore IPM. And I've got another account at Fido Poetry. You can also uh, follow our program on YouTube at Integrated Pest Management. I can be reached at the email address shown there. And I just wanted to say thank you for listening to this Crop Protection Network episode of Virtual Crop Scout School on Armchair Scouting. Have a good day.